Okay, so hi everyone. We're gonna look at a paper two for coordinated science. Uh, so this is the extended paper. It's 45 minutes long and you have 40 questions. So that means that you will have around one minute per question. So you need to work quickly, but remember some questions take less time than others. So you've got 45 minutes. There's 40 marks for this paper. You will have to answer on a separate answer sheet, but I'm gonna work, but you're allowed to do workings out on this paper and I'll just be doing the workings out on this paper and just circling the correct answer. There's usually about 13 marks or 13 questions per subject with one uh, question, have, one subject having 14 questions. Sometimes a subject that you're more comfortable with is at the end. So for example, physics in this paper is at the end. So if you feel more comfortable with physics, remember you can skip ahead and do those questions first. So you save yourself some time and then you can go back and do the more difficult questions. If you do do that, just be very careful that you put the questions in the correct box on the answer sheet because it can cause a bit of confusion there. So we're gonna skip ahead to question 28 because those are the physics questions. So first section you can see is all biology. And then past that, we've got chemistry. And then at question 28, we will have physics questions. Here we go. So an object falls freely in a vacuum. And I'm gonna highlight that because that is very important. Which speed time graph represents the motion of the object? So vacuum means no air resistance. So that means that the acceleration is constant. So if the acceleration is constant, we're looking for a speed time graph where it's increasing in speed, it's accelerating, there's a positive acceleration and it is constant. So already we can remove question A and B because they are decelerating and it's between C and D. And this is why it's really important that I highlighted vacuum. D is the correct answer because we've got constant acceleration. If an object was allowed to fall freely in an, something with an atmosphere, for example, like on earth, it would reach terminal velocity. The acceleration would be not constant and it would look like this for a speed time graph. So D is the correct answer there. Okay, let's go to question 29. And this looks like it is a density question or a volume question of some kind, but let's read through it. An irregularly shaped object is lowered into a measuring cylinder of water. The object, as the object is lowered into the water, the water level rises from 50 centimeters to 75 centimeters. The object has a mass of 50 grams. What is the density of the object? So you need to remember that density equals mass over volume. Now, one useful thing is if you don't remember that here, it's actually giving you the equation. You can see that all the units are grams per cubic centimeter. So it's telling you take mass and divide it by volume. So the mass is 50 grams and the volume is the change in volume. So the volume of the rock or the irregularly shaped object is how much water it has displaced in the measuring cylinder. So the volume is going to be 75 minus 50. So it's 25 cubic centimeters. So that means it's 20, 50 divided by 25, which is two grams per cubic centimeter. And so the answer is D. Okay, so you see you could have to do quite a bit to get that mark. But normally then that means that other questions are a little bit quicker. So for example, this one is a quick definition question. Which source of energy is non-renewable? Well, we know hydroelectric is renewable. Tides are renewable. Waves are renewable. So the answer has to be nuclear fission. And that's because uranium is limited or the supply of uranium on earth is limited. So we will eventually run out. We can't replace it. So it's non-renewable. All right, let's do question 31. The diagram shows an object made partly of wood and partly of iron. Thermal energy is supplied in the position shown. Point P is marked at the bottom of the object. How does most thermal energy reach point P? Well, wood is an insulator. And iron is a metal and then for a conductor. And so therefore most of the most of the thermal energy is probably gonna flow through 
the iron by, so it's either of those two, it's gonna flow through iron by conduction. And so the answer is A. Okay, let's do question 32 and 35. Again, some more definition ones here. Light undergoes total internal reflection in an optical fiber. So it's a total internal reflection question. What statement explains why this reflection occurs? So again, total internal re reflection occurs when, if you've got a medium here that has a greater refractive index than this medium. So we've got medium one, medium two. And if we've got light going in here, like so, if refraction occurs like this, where the refraction, where the refract, the angle of refraction is 90 degrees, this angle here, this angle of incidence is called the critical angle. Now, if I make with another ray of light, the angle of incidence, whoops, the angle of incidence greater than the critical angle, I will always get reflection. So that means that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refraction. Nope, that's not correct. The angle of incidence is greater than the angle of reflection. Nope, that's not correct. The angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. That's the correct answer, but let's double check. The angle of incidence is less than the critical angle. No, that's not correct. Okay, and uh, let's do 33. Which, which statement about sound waves is not correct? So sound waves, and we're looking for something incorrect. They are caused by, by vibrations. Well, that is correct. So I'll put an X there. That's not what we're looking for. They are longitudinal. Nope, that is correct. They transfer energy. Yep, they do transfer energy. They travel in a vacuum. That is the incorrect answer. They do not travel in a vacuum. So that is therefore not correct. So that is our correct answer. Right, let's do seven more questions. Seven more to go before the end of the paper. Okay, question 34. A circuit contains a battery, a fixed resistor, an ammeter, and a variable resistor. How much charge flows through the variable resistor in 30 seconds? Now, in this case, it's a series circuit, so the charge is always going to be the same. And that means that, uh, sorry, the current is always going to be the same. And we've got a reading here of 1.8 milliamps. So 1.8 milliamps equals 1.8 times 10 to the minus three amperes. So it's very important we do that conversion there. Okay. So we've got current. That's our value for current. We know time is 30 seconds. So we do charge equals current times time. And so charge is going to equal 1.8 times 10 to the minus three times 30. And that should equal, we just do it really quickly. Zero point five, zero point zero five four coulombs. So the answer there is whoops. The answer there is A. Okay, a copper wire has a resistance of eight ohms. Four of these wires are arranged side by side to form a cable, as shown. What is the resistance of these cables? So this is basically a four resistor question. We've essentially got four resistors in parallel. And we know that the resistance of all four of them, so we've got four resistors in parallel, and essentially all four resistors have a resistance of eight ohms each. Now you could use a very complicated, four, or you could use the one over total resistance equals one over R1 plus one over R2 all the way. But because I know that the resistors are all equal and there's four of them, all I have to do is just take the resistance of one of them and divide it by how many I've got in parallel. So in this case, there's four resistors 
each with a resistance of eight ohms. So I do eight divided by four, and it gives me two ohms. Okay. This only works though, if the resistors are of equal value. Okay. okay, question 36, last one on this page. Diagram shows a, a circuit containing a resistor and an NTC thermistor. The temperature of the thermistor increases. What happens to the resistance of the thermistor and what happens to the reading on the voltmeter? Now this gets a bit weird, but in this case, the thermistor, the resistance is going to decrease. And because the resistance decreases, that actually means there's gonna be more voltage across it. So it's going to be decrease and increases. It's going to be B, okay. Okay, so for 37, an electrical extension block has four sockets. A cable which can, own, which can safely take a current of six amperes and a plug is protected by a fuse rated at five amperes. The extension block is used with four appliances and the five, a, five ampere fuse blows. The owner of the fuse replaces the five amp fuse with a 13 amp fuse. Why is the extension block now dangerous? Well, in this case, we don't need to do any cal calculation, but the cable can safely take a current of six amperes. And so that's why originally we had a fuse rated at five amperes, because the idea is that if there is a current greater than five amperes, the fuel fuse will break, and that means no current will flow through the circuit, which means that it safely shuts off before it reaches six amperes. Now the problem is, is that the fuse will break at only 13 amperes or above. But the problem is, is that the wire or the cable can take a current of only six amperes. So the main reason is that that were not protected from high current. So let's look for the correct answer there. The appliances may not receive enough current. Nope. The cable may overheat before the fuse blows. Yep, that looks possible. The sockets may burn out before the fuse blows. The sockets, no. The 13 amp fuse may blow too soon. No, so the answer is B. The cable may overheat. So the problem is with the cable, could the cable can safely take five amperes, oh, six amperes. So that means if it goes past six amperes, you're going to have too much current in there. When you have a lot of current going through a wire, it increases the temperature, it's going to overheat. So that's the that is why it is now dangerous. Okay, three more questions. Question 38. The diagram shows a wire in a magnetic field. The current in the wire is in the direction shown. The direction of the magnetic field is also shown. So this is a Fleming's left-hand rule problem. So the magnetic field causes a force on the wire, which direction does this force act? So we need to use Fleming's left-hand rule. Left-hand rule. And so if I terribly draw a hand here, so this is our thumb, that's our index finger, and outside here is our middle finger, like so. And then we've got our two other fingers there like that. Please bear with me. I'm not an artist, but that is our thumb. Oops, I've drawn it around the wrong way, haven't I? So let's erase that. Okay, so what we'll do, instead of drawing it on the board, it might be easier just to do it like this. So the thumb points upwards. And that is the direction of motion. Then your index finger is the direction of the magnetic field. And then your middle finger is the direction of current. And so what we have to do is with our left hand, line that up with what we know. So if we look here, our index finger is field. So that means our index finger on our left hand should be pointing down. Our middle finger, if we extend it out, uh, if we extend it out to follow the direction, keeping our index finger pointing down, our, uh, our middle finger for the current is going to go from left to right. And that means that if you've done this correctly, the direction that the force is acting at, or the direction of motion, so thumb for force or thumb for motion, is pointing into the screen for me, 
which means it's pointing into the page. Okay, so that's a Fleming's left-hand ball problem. Okay, question 39. How does the ionizing effect and the penetrating ability of alpha emissions compare with those of beta emissions? So alpha is more ionizing than beta. So let's say those two are correct. That's incorrect. And alpha is less penetrating than beta. So the only option is B. Okay, and radioactive isotope has a half-life of 18 years. So I'm gonna write T a half equals 18 years. A sample contains 80 million atoms of this isotope. How long does it take for the number of atoms in the sample to decrease to 10 million? Okay, so if we started off with 80 million, after 18 years, it will have gone down to 40 million. After another 18 years, it will have gone down to 20 million. It halves each time. And then after another 18 years, it is halved once again, and it has gone down to 18 years. So in that case, it is 18 times three, which is so this plus this equals the total time, and that is 54 years. And so there, the answer is C. Okay, folks, hope you found that useful. Come back later and we will do some more paper twos, but also paper thought four theory papers, as well as some alternative to practical papers.